1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as risen from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, and not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is exempted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptised on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptised on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, 
Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ Star differs from star in glory. And so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have come, sorry, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Amen. And I'll now call upon Jeff to open that text for us tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we come today on Resurrection Sunday, Lord, where we remember in this special way, this special time, just all of the the grace and mercy and loving kindness that you have shown us, the great sacrifice that you have made for us, the love that you have shown. We thank you for the hope that we have in you, in your victory over the grave, in your resurrection. Lord, we thank you that as we are united to you by faith. Lord, that you change us into resurrected people ourselves. 
Lord, we pray that tonight, Lord, you would help us to know something of your resurrection power. God, that you would speak, that you would give us ears to hear, hearts and minds to understand. Lord, help us to see as you see. God, give us hearts that love like yours. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. My sermon tonight is called This is Only the Beginning. Easter weekend is a time where we come and and remember and celebrate uh, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which of course is the heart of Christianity. It's, It's what the whole Bible points to, and it's the culmination of of all of it. But in another sense, it's only the beginning. 1 Corinthians 15, and really the whole book, the whole letter of, to the first, to the whole first letter of, to the Corinthians, yeah, you know what I mean. The letter of 1 Corinthians is all about taking that gospel and connecting it with our day-to-day life, connecting what we know about Jesus' death and resurrection, and ascension, the Easter story, with our day-to-day reality. That's what we were talking about this morning when Logan was preaching from Romans 6, connecting what we know about Jesus' resurrection to our lives in Him. And if you didn't get, you weren't here this morning, um, then I do commend that to you, the recording of that online. And it's important that we're able to make that connection between what we believe in the way that we live. Because for some of us, for a lot of Christians, the Christian faith is, is kind of like an airport departure lounge. Um, my wife and I have been overseas uh, to visit family a few times back when that was a thing that you could do. And uh, sometimes we've had connecting flights uh, where we've wound up in the airport in Singapore a few times. And the, so the airport in Singapore is the best in the world, like objectively, it's award-winning. They have over 40 different attractions there in the airport, like museums and mazes and entertainment centers and exhibits and sculptures and playgrounds and museums and shopping. They've got so much stuff that you really can't experience it all in the few hours that you might have there. At some point, you have to kind of leave it all behind and go through security to your flight or rather to the departure lounge. And I think for a lot of people, Christianity is a lot like that departure lounge. You were in the world having a good time. And then someone kind of rudely came along and told you about heaven and hell. And that if you don't hurry, you'll miss your flight. And so you went through security. And Jesus took all the bombs and drugs out of your bag so that you could go through free. And that was a huge relief. But now you're just kind of waiting. Right? You're just sitting there with with nothing to do with all of these people from every tribe and tongue and nation, but you don't know what to talk about. I mean, you're all going to the same place. You're just waiting. Doesn't that sound like church sometimes? And that's why people only come at, at Easter and Christmas. They want to spend as little time as possible in that departure lounge. There's a disconnect between what we believe happened in the past the Easter story, Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and what we believe, or you know, perhaps at least hope, is going to happen in the future. Something with clouds and harps, and sounds kind of lame, but it's better than fire that burns forever. And either way, pretty irrelevant to life today. There's a disconnect. And so Paul, in this letter, is writing to a, a community of Christians who are experiencing a a different but a similar kind of disconnect. They believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but they see this life as all there is. They are unable to connect his resurrection and his resurrection life with their own lives. And Paul Paul begins to correct them by reminding them of what it is that they believe in the first part of that chapter there. Uh, Verses 1 and 2, Now I would remind you, brothers or brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. And then he he goes on from uh, verses 3 through 7 to give what is quite likely the church's first confession of faith, a creed that 
scholars believe may have uh, been formulated and recited by Christians as early as months after Jesus' ascension. Now, when, when Peter preached at Pentecost and 3,000 were added to their number in that one day, well, they would have had to quickly think of how are we going to teach these people the basics of the faith, the gospel in a nutshell. From the second part of verse 3 there, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. The Corinthians, they, they would have known that off by heart. You know, they, they could well have recited that every time they met together. And yet, Paul sees it worth it to use precious, expensive parchment to write it out again. Because if they really carefully think about what it is that they believe here, then they'll see that their conclusions about life and the way that they are living make no sense. Look at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can you, some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? This was the, the thinking that the Corinthian Christians were saying, right? That, you know, the idea that there's, there's real life after death is just ridiculous. You know, either our souls float away to cloudland or life just ends. The, you know, there's, there's no evidence for anything else. I'm sure we all know people who believe one of those two things. Maybe we are people who believe one of those two things. But Paul argues, you know, how can you say that there's no evidence? What, how can you say one minute Christ was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, but then in the next minute say that people can't come back to life after they've died? That's just wishful thinking. Paul's saying that doesn't make sense. There's a disconnect. Verse 13, if people cannot be raised, then not even Christ has been raised. Verse 14, if, if Jesus wasn't raised, then all of this confessing and professing and preaching and church stuff is a waste of time. Verse 15, in fact, we are lying about God because we said that he raised Jesus, which is false if human beings cannot be raised from the dead and will not be resurrected. And then down in verse 19, if there's no resurrection, no life after death, then Paul says, well, let me be the first to say that Christians are idiots. But he takes us back to verses 1 and 2. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you and you received, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And then he takes us over to verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And not only that, he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does it mean that he is the first fruits? Well, first of all, it means that he is the best. The idea of first fruits in the Bible comes from uh, ancient Israel. In harvest time, when they were to offer their first fruits as a sacrifice at the temple. So the first fruit, not the kind of manky fruit that you picked off the ground halfway through the season when you were sick of it anyway. The first fruit. The fruit that you'd been watching eagerly grow on the tree out the window while it was still cold and wintry. And in doing so, in offering that first fruit, and this is the, the second and most important thing that it means. In doing so, you are making a statement. In, in offering that first fruit, you are making the statement that you trusted God, that this was the first, that this is only the beginning. As I, as I offer this basket of the, the first fresh food that I've seen in six months, I do it in faith that God will bless the harvest, that it will come, that God will provide plenty of fruit and food 
for the rest of the year. And so you could, you could do it in joy. You could offer it in joy. In fact, this whole occasion would be one of joy because harvest time is coming and this first fruits is the proof that we can trust God to provide for us, to do what he promised. And harvest time, in those days, it wasn't an individual affair. And not everyone had wheat fields and vineyards and orchards. But everyone, of course, in the community depended on those things. They depended on that fruit. And so they would all pitch in for the harvest. You, know, you see a little bit of that in, in Ruth, the story of Ruth, with all the, they have the, the barley harvest, with all the reaping and gathering and gleaning. And the poor are allowed to take whatever they need. And this atmosphere of of joy and faith, you can just imagine people working and laughing and singing, children playing, people filling baskets with fruits and vegetables, bundling grain for threshing. You can imagine the long evenings of, of celebration, of feasting, of celebrating God's goodness and provision, the joy of the harvest, and all of it kicked off by that first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15.20 is telling us that Jesus is the first fruits. The Lord Jesus Christ is the first fruits. His bodily resurrection from death is God's promise that the harvest is just around the corner. That this is just the beginning. The time has come to get up out of that departure lounge chair and to take up your, your sickles and your baskets and gird up your loins and strap up your sandals and call your brothers and sisters. Because the harvest is here, and it's going to take all of us. Jesus said in Matthew 9 and Luke 10, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the first book in the Narnia series, the children first come through that wardrobe, into a land that is dying, a world that is dying. You know, always winter, never Christmas. The rivers are frozen solid. The, the trees and the grass are dying under snow. People and animals starving under the oppression of that age of winter. You know, not, not to mention being turned to stone by the white witch. You know, nothing grows. Year after year, it gets worse. They've stepped into a dying world. A whole world that is slowly but surely moving from life to death. But then, of course, Aslan comes, and little by little that curse is lifted. Snow melts, and rivers flow again, and grass grows, and spring has come. And this world that was moving from life to death is now moving from death to life. Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits. It's the lifting of the curse which the world was under, the curse of sin and death, moving from life to death. Now it's being transformed from death to life. Look at verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, or as just As everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. See, the resurrection of Jesus is only the beginning. The Holy Spirit, who brings eternal life, has been poured out on the church and empowers her to go with this life-giving message, this good news that the first fruits has come, that the curse has been lifted, that the harvest is on its way. Now, how then? How then do we fix this disconnect? You know, if this is what we believe, right, that, the, that not only has one man been raised from death, but his resurrection is the beginning of a great harvest that will one day culminate in a, an entirely new heaven and earth, free at last from all the traces of the curse of sin and death. Well, what does that mean for us right now? And that's what Paul gets to in verse 29, or from 29 onward. Uh, Look, for example, at the second part of verse 32. If the dead are not raised, let us eat 
and drink, for tomorrow we die. If the world is dying, if it's moving from life to death, if our final destiny is just to be wiped out by a huge meteorite, or the earth to be consumed by the sun, if there's no hope of life after death, well then there's no point in sitting here and waiting for a plane that's never taking off. We need to live life now, right? And we need to live it for ourselves. Chase your dreams, seize opportunities, hustle hard for money and experiences, soak it all in. Don't worry about other people unless they can help you. You don't have time, right? I, we don't like to say this, but honestly, if, if all we have to look forward to is death, then really selfish living is the only thing that makes sense. It's the only way to live that's logical. But, verse 34, that is to show no knowledge of God. We don't live in a world that's moving from life to death. We live in a world that's moving from death to life. Verse 54 and 55 show this so wonderfully. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the first fruits. He is the promise. And so Paul can confidently say, as he, in verse 30, is in danger every hour, as he dies every day, as he fights with wild beasts in Ephesus, whether that's real wild animals or angry arguments against his message or even his own temptations to sin, all of that, all of that danger and dying and fighting is all worth it because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. As Paul himself talks about in Philippians 3, that that surpassing worth of knowing him and gaining him and being found in him and having a righteousness in him and knowing the power of his resurrection. Because verse 36, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. See, if, if the world is moving from life to death, then we have no choice but to live our best lives now, to chase all the pleasure we can. To, I mean, you might say that we're actually enslaved to that kind of selfish living, that inherent selfishness. We must live now because we will die later. But... If Christ has been raised and the world is moving from death to life, well, then we are free, right? We're free. Free to what? We're free to die now because we will live later. Why would we want to do that? Have a look at verse 36 through 38. It's because what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. If you skip down to verse 42, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. And if you skip over to verse 50, I tell you this, brothers or brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. See, dying to self now is how we get the glory to come. That, that act of selfless love, when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, on our behalf, to take away our sin. And of course, that world-rescuing, curse-lifting, harvest-bringing, season-changing event that is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, as it says, the promise of God that these perishable bodies will put on the imperishable, as it says there in verse 53. These events that we celebrate this weekend, they set us free. Free to say 
no to sin. Verse 34 there. We don't need it. We don't need to live selfishly anymore. We are free, free to love as God loves. Selflessly, sacrificially. Sowing seeds that look like dying every day. Dying to ourselves. Because these are the days of the harvest. And even they cannot compare with the glory that is to come. As it says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your, your labor is not in vain. And so I hope by now you're beginning to see that connection between this event from 2,000 years ago that we celebrate and this future event that we look forward to Verse 52, the end of verse 52 there, for the, where the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed. You see the connection between these two events and our lives today. But if, if, if not, let me give you a challenge, right? If you, if you believe in the resurrection of Christ and you are united with him in that resurrection by faith, as we saw in Romans 6, then I challenge you this week to do something that you could only do if you believed and if you were certain of your own resurrection. Something you couldn't bring yourself to do if this life was all there is. Now, I'm not talking about taking stupid risks. I'm talking about things like spending time praying, reading the Bible. Time that you otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to spend. You know, sharing the good news with someone. Knowing that by dying to your own comfort and fear, you are planting seeds that may well bring forth glorious fruit-bearing trees. I challenge you to wade into somebody's pain and suffering. Knowing that God raised Christ from the dead, that he raised you from being dead in your trespasses and sins, and he can raise this person out of their suffering, into resurrection hope. I challenge you this week, send some money, give something away. Serve God in a way that would only make sense if there was a harvest just around the corner. Because there is. C.S. Lewis wrote, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have large, largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. The more you think of that imperishable kingdom, that the, the people of the king, Jesus Christ, will inherit, the more good you'll do in this world, the more good you'll do for this world, the better you'll be able to love it with the selfless love with which God loved the world. You know, some Christians can be too optimistic about this. You know, they, they see that the first fruits have come, and so they expect the whole harvest today. You know, they expect that uh, Christians should be rich and healthy and never suffer. They think that they are imperishable now, and that's wrong. We don't want to be sort of veering off into an optimism for things that God does not promise. But equally, there's also the opposite problem of having a, a, a faithless pessimism where we are frozen in fear, cursed by that endless winter. Right? We, we refuse to believe the promise of the first fruits. We fail to see that the harvest is plentiful. Verse 34 calls us to wake up. Verse 58 calls us to abound in the work of the Lord. Now, yes, we face danger and we fight, and we die a thousand deaths every day. But we do it in the certain hope of inheriting an imperishable kingdom. As sure as the resurrection of Christ from the dead, the gospel which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 32 to 36. Show us a picture of what this looks like. Hebrews 10.32 But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, 
sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And these people served in a way that they could not serve if there wasn't a resurrection. To have compassion on people in prison, to joyfully accept the plundering of their property. They could do that since they knew they had a better possession and an abiding one. So rather than that kind of prosperity gospel optimism or that faithless pessimism, we need to have a a biblical realism that, that faces hardship with joy because this is only the beginning. Because the harvest is here. You know, a few decades of seed planting and then endless millennia of harvest celebration. So that's my challenge. Do something this week that you could not do if you weren't certain of the resurrection. And if you're not a believer or you're not sure, then I challenge you to consider what this chapter is saying. 1 Corinthians 15. Consider what the Bible is saying here. If if Christ was not raised from the dead, then all of this church stuff is pointless, okay? So you need to investigate that first. Because if he is raised from the dead, well, then you have a choice. Are you going to follow him as he brings this world from death to life? Will you follow him by dying to your own sin and selfishness and joining the harvest celebration? Or will you remain enslaved to a hopeless life of selfishness that only ends in death and hell? See, Christianity is not an airport departure lounge. Christ the first fruits has been raised. The winter curse of death and sin is over. And now these are the days of the harvest. Right? These are the, uh, the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming his flesh. This is only the beginning. This is the year of jubilee when, when slaves are set free and debts are forgiven. And so we can die now to live later. We can live with selfless love, with harvest joy, with resurrection realism. All because Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And this is only the beginning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate not an anomaly in history where someone came back from the dead, but we celebrate a change in history, a change of the season where the curse of sin is lifted and we enter into this age of harvest, this age of the kingdom where Christ is enthroned and the church goes forth in resurrection power. God, we thank you for the gospel that has saved us, that has brought us to this new life. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that resurrects us from our death and trespasses and sins. Lord, we pray that you would help us to go forth in the hope that your resurrection has brought, in the hope that these are the days of the harvest, that you are just the first fruits, that this is only the beginning, and that though we will face trials and we will be uh, facing danger and needing to die to ourselves, Lord, we thank you that our labor is not in vain. We thank you that as we do that, we sow seeds which will be raised again in glory. Lord, we thank you so much for the hope we have in Christ and we pray that you would help us to make that connection. That we would live every day 
in light of these gospel truths. God, help us to serve you in the knowledge that we will spend eternity with you. Lord, give us boldness, give us confidence, give us a realistic optimism, knowing that Christ is victorious, that death no longer has its sting. God, we pray for this in Jesus' name, for his glory. Amen.